can sit through this. And secondly, I don't have a horrible 20 minute or 15 minute time, you know, uh, time limit. Um, I want to thank you for the invitation very much. It's, it's an opportunity to meet old friends and make some new ones. And it's also a, an opportunity to test drive some ideas for, from the book that I just completed, which is called um, Contradictions of Real Socialism, The Conductor and the Conducted. Um, and um, let me just say something about the description that was distributed, you know, um, because it's a bit dated. I'm not in Venezuela anymore. Um, I left last year after being there since 2004, more or less permanently. <laughs> And um, we can discuss the reasons over vodka uh, in the uh, reception. Um, the, the socialist, uh, the, um, the socialist alternative is out. Came out in 2010, and uh, but I'm not doing the book that was listed there on on Marx. Um, I decided it was more interest, more important to be writing a book on on the socialist experience or the experience of socialism in the 20th century than to do another book on Marx. Um, and in any event, um, that book contract was with Palgrave Macmillan, and I decided I didn't want to do any more publishing with capitalist presses. Um, so um, they're too expensive, and you know they don't promote you; they just sell for the libraries. Um, and I'm very happy with Bunce Review, which which publishes me. Um, the paper I'm going to give draws on one chapter of, of the book, uh, but it goes beyond real socialism to link up to some of the themes that have been raised in this conference. Um, and uh, it brings in as well material from The Socialist Alternative and the book Beyond Capital. And the paper's title is uh, The Concept of Fairness, uh, Possibilities, Limitations, and po Possibilities. And I don't have any visual aids. This is old professors don't have those. Um, but you know, at some point, you can imagine possibilities will be flashed and then limitations <laughs> and possibilities. <laughs> so, um, people get angry when their sense of fairness is violated. Sometimes they protest, sometimes they erupt like volcanoes, sometimes they riot, and sometimes they organize. Sometimes, on the other hand, they do nothing. They grumble and accept that there is no alternative. They become cynical and focus on individual escapes and exits. There are both possibilities and limitations in the concept of fairness. Referring to social norms and beliefs as to right and wrong, E.P. Thompson introduced the concept of the moral economy of the poor in his classic article, The Moral Economy of the English Crowd of, in the 18th Century. Uh, Thompson argued that the food riots of this period reflected a broad and passionate consensus on what was right leading to a sharp reaction to egregious violations of that concept of justice. Commenting on Thompson's account, a recent Chinese analyst of worker protests in China by the name of Li Jun observed that, quote, those rioters were legitimized by the belief that they were defending traditional rights or customs that were supported by the wider consensus of the community, close quote. Similarly, in his work on the moral economy of the peasant, James Scott focused upon the notion of economic justice among peasants and pointed to revolts and rebellions which could erupt when notions of fairness were violated. For Scott, these conceptions of justice had their roots in the need for maintaining subsistence rather than opposition to exploitation as such. The test for the peasant, Scott proposed, is more likely to be what is left than how much is taken. From this perspective, exploitation in itself does not generate riots, revolts, and rebellions. Moral economists, one writer, uh, Jeffrey Kopstein, uh, Kopstein uh, commented in his study of worker resistance in East Germany, moral economists posit the existence of a tacit social contract in almost every long-standing social formation in which subaltern groups tolerate their own exploitation, end of quote. And he's saying, these groups tolerate that exploitation as long as they are left enough for themselves. In other words, able to secure their expected subsistence. When the prevailing norm is violated, however, Kopstein proposed that it generates, quote, resistance ranging from shirking, grumbling, foot dragging, false compliance, dissimulation, and other weapons of the weak to, on the other hand, open strikes and other forms of collective action, close quote. But only to negate that violation. According to moral economist Kopstein reported, exploited groups 
simply want to restore their previous standards before the downturn. Rarely do they try to overturn the existing order altogether." Close quote. Well, the underlying concept there is one of equilibrium, a concept which Thompson employed explicitly in talking about, quote, a particular set of social relations, a particular equilibrium between paternalist authority and the crowd, end of quote. And if we talk about equilibrium, we're saying, if that and when that equilibrium is disturbed, there's a feedback mechanism. Peasants, masses, peasants, crowd, workers, react to restore the conditions corresponding to the social norms which were supported by the consensus of the community. Thus, all other things equal, there's a tendency towards stability. That's who disturbed equilibrium, restore equilibrium. <coughs> We can see this phenomenon in the real socialism, always in quotes, or the actually existing socialism of the latter part of the 20th century, a term which was introduced in the Soviet Union to distinguish its real experience from merely theoretical ideas about socialism. In what has been described as the social contract, characteristic of real socialism, workers had definite expectations as to their entitlement. They expected rising income over time, subsidized necessities, relative egalitarianism, and especially job rights. Not only the guarantee of a job, which was supported by a full employment policy, but also protection from any changes in their existing jobs which they did not want. In return, workers accepted the rule of the vanguard party in the workplace and society, and comprehensive restrictions upon any power and indeed initiatives from below. Boris Kogolitsky described this as follows. He said, quote, there was a system of mutual obligations. We use the term obligatory social contract or asymmetrical social contract, meaning that the population was forced into the social contract. The social contract was definitely not free. On the other hand, if you lived in the country, you understood that though the population was forced into the contract, it was accepted not just because there was no other way, but because people liked certain aspects of the contract. So think of it. The right of everyone to subsistence and a growing standard of life, the importance of stable prices and full employment, the orientation toward egalitarianism and thus low income differences, in income differentials, all these were part of the norms which formed the moral economy of the working class in real socialism. While that social contract did not exclude exploitation, it did yield something workers wanted. Kopstein argued, for example, that along with job security, East German workers had the power to demand a rough and ready sort of wage egalitarianism and consumer prices that remained low relative to wages, close quote. And the same argument for a moral economy of the working class and the support for this which the social contract provided is explicit in Li Jun's examination of strikes in China. Quote, simply put in the Chinese socialist setting, workers view themselves as having a relationship with the state, a relationship which operates according to the norm of reciprocity. The state is expected to have committed itself to ensuring that the workers have a decent living by providing job security and a prodigious welfare package, while workers in return advocate the party ruling by giving their political support and loyalty to the state." Close quote. To support what Li Jun called the workers' moral economy, it was expected that the state would fulfill its responsibility, quote, to protect and benefit its working class in the form of the iron rice bowl, close quote. What happened, what, what occurred in real socialism when this popular consensus of justice and fairness was violated? According to the Hungarian economist Janos Kornai, when this occurred, a process of feedback tended to restore an equilibrium. When the economy generates, quote, results which deviate from existing norms, the results of habit, convention, tacit or legally supported social acceptance or conformity, the system generates signals that are fed back into the system, close quote. Kornai argued that the central decision makers in Hungary had as a target a normal rate of growth of real consumption per head of three to four percent per year with the result that, quote, if the growth of consumption remains below its normal rate, the scale of investment will be reduced so as to leave more of the national income for consumption, quote. And it was very clear for Cornell why those at the top acted that way. They were limited by, quote, what the population is content to accept and where dissatisfaction begins. 
there was, close quote, there was a potential cost to violating the norms. Quote, holding back increases in living standards or their absolute reduction and infringing the lower limit sooner or later entails serious political and social consequences, tension, and even shocks, which after a shorter or longer lag force a correction, close quote. In other words, behind the attempt of the vanguard to avoid deviations from the norm was the anticipation of the response of workers, for example, to increase prices. People, Cornei stated, wanted price stability, and quote, after a time, they even expect the government to guarantee it. Any important incre price increase gives rise to unrest, close quote. So according to Cornei argued, those at the top were limited in this respect. The barrier, quote, depends on the actual socio-political situation, what level and growth rate of consumption the population is content to accept, and where dissatisfaction begins. And if there's dissatisfaction, at what point it starts to enable, endanger the stability of the system. It is a historical fact, he continued, that unrest may be so great that it induces leaders to change economic policy, close quote. So we can see then in real socialism that the moral economy of the working class <coughs> was reinforced during this period by the honoring of the existing social contract. Those at the top understood that people would respond to perceived violations of the social contract, as they did in 1962 in, you know, in riots uh, in response to price increases. Um, and those at the top took those potential responses into account in their actions. When ideas grasp the minds of masses, Marx noted, ideas are a material force. And when people struggle to reverse violations of their concepts of right and wrong, those concepts are clearly a material force rather than disembodied ideas. However, in such struggles, more occurs than just the return to initial equilibrium. Even though people may not be struggling against exploitation as such, something more than what they themselves intend is produced in that process. Very simply, people change in the course of struggle. Um, that, that's the concept of you know, Marx's concept of revolutionary practice. The coincidence of the changing of circumstances and human activity were self-change. People change and struggle. And despite, for example, you know, um, the limited goals of wage struggles, Marx commented in 1853, wage struggles prevented workers, quote, from becoming apathetic, thoughtless, more or less well-fed fed instruments of production, end of quote. And he continued, Without those wage struggles, workers would be, quote, a heartbroken, a weak-minded, a worn-out, unresisting mass, close quote. And he returned to the same point in 1865, noting that workers who did not engage in wage struggles, quote, would be degraded to one level mass of broken wretches past salvation, close quote. Can we doubt that? After all, those who are not engaged in struggle are producing themselves as people of a particular type. Thus, even though the moral economy of the working class as such is not an immediate challenge to exploitation, it can be the basis for a process by which workers themselves change in the course of struggle. This, then, is the possibility inherent in the concepts of right and wrong and of fairness characteristic of the moral economy of the working class. It's the possibility of building upon those existing beliefs to the point of challenging exploitation and the system itself directly. Limitations. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, the example of real socialism points to the real limits of that moral economy concept. It demonstrates that concepts of fairness and of a consensus of, of what is right and what is wrong are not sufficient to prevent their violation. After all, in real socialism, the social contract which basically was there from 1950, and that's the period I'm looking at, 1950 to through the 80s, uh, the social contract which embodied and reinforced the moral economy of the working class was not merely unfulfilled in some respect. On the contrary, it was unilaterally revoked by the vanguard. And rather than this leading to resistance by the working class to restore the social contract, there was no appreciable resistance to the ending of the social contract, whether it was in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, China, or currently in Cuba. And this problem is not simply a particular characteristic of real socialism. 
After all, consider what happened to the moral economy of the poor discussed by E.P. Thompson. The historic particular set of relations, that particular equilibrium between paternalist authority and the crowd that he described also came to an end. As in the case of real socialism, Thompson observed that, quote, the nature of things which had once made imperative in times of dearth at least some symbolic solidarity between the rulers and the poor now dictated solidarity between the rulers and the employment of capital, close quote. In other words, those protests of the 18th century were defeated. They went beyond them. And if we add to these cases the experience in the developed capitalist world in the period after World War II, when the so-called Golden Age and Capital Labor Accord were dissolved from the top without serious resistance from the working class, there appears to be a definite pattern. And that pattern is that in every tacit social contract based merely upon inherited concepts of fairness, the subaltern groups cannot prevent the social contract from being abandoned entirely by those who rule. To understand why, consider Marx's discussion of the spontaneous concepts of fairness characteristic of workers in 19th century capitalism. Marx understood that the attitudes and notions of moral economy exist at the surface of society. Rather than revealing the actual relations, they reflect how things appear and may necessarily appear to the real actors. What is apparent in everyday life spontaneously produces the ideas that grasp the minds of masses and underlie their actions. After all, what did workers in 19th century Europe struggle about? In his book, or short, his talk, Value, Price, and Profit, Marx observed that 99% of wage struggles followed changes that had led wages to fall. Quote, in one word, they were reactions of labor against the previous action of capital, close quote. In short, those wage struggles were attempts to restore the traditional standard of life which was under attack, just like the moral economy discussions. The spontaneous impulse of workers under these conditions, accordingly, was to fight for fairness against the violations of existing norms. Indeed, to fight a guerrilla war against effects initiated by capital, Marx's term. The explicit goal of, Mar of workers, Marx noted, was to struggle for, quote, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, close quote. And in doing so, they were not attempting to change the system, nor were they indeed struggling against exploitation, except insofar as exploitation was understood as unfairness. Accordingly, Marx described the demands of workers as conservative, and he argued that instead of those demands for fairness, they ought to inscribe on their banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wages system. Yet, Marx understood quite well why the workers' slogan focus on fair wages and a fair workday. It flows from the necessary appearance of a transaction in which the worker yields the property right to use her capacity to work, in other words, her labor power, for a given period. Marx commented and described this in Capital as follows, quote, on the surface of bourgeois society, the worker's wage appears as the price of labor, as a certain quantity of money that is paid for a certain quantity of labor. Close quote. Thus, the conscious struggle of workers over the fairness of that certain quantity of money and the fairness of that certain quantity of labor follows. What is perceived as just and fair is that they receive an equivalent for their labor, that they're not cheated. This follows from the way the wage necessarily appears as this payment for a quantity of labor. From the form of the wage as this payment for a given work date, Marx commented, quote, from this comes all the notions of justice held by both the worker and the capitalist, close quote. Nothing is easier, Marx commented, to understand than the necessity, the raison d'etre, of this form of appearance, a form of appearance which underlies the moral economy of the working class in capitalism. In short, that appearance was not an accident, nor was the moral economy of workers based on appearances an accident. 
On the surface, the worker sells her labor to the capitalist. However, this form of appearance, Marx commented, quote, makes the actual relation invisible and indeed presents to the eye the precise opposite of that relation, close quote. Specifically, there appears to be no exploitation, no division of the workday into necessary labor and surplus labor. Rather, all labor appears as paid labor, precisely because exploitation is hidden on the surface it's necessary to go beneath the surface, to delve beneath the surface. Marx's point was, quote, the, ex the forms of appearance are reproduced directly and spontaneously as current and usual modes of thought. The essential relation must first be discovered by science, close quote. In other words, at the level of appearances, we cannot understand capitalism. Well, the interconnection of the reproduction process is not understood, Marx said. Close quote. Accordingly, he, he rejected a focus on individual commodity transactions, sales of labor power, and examined the underlying structure of capitalism. What was the nature of the system and how was it reproduced? And that is the central question in Marx's capital. Considering workers as a whole, he assumed that in return for yielding to the capitalists the use of their capacities, workers receive their traditional standard of life what is necessary to reproduce them as wage laborers in a given time and place. This concept of a given standard of necessity, which is the basis for the value of labor power, allowed Marx to demonstrate how the working day is divided into necessary labor and surplus labor, and how exploitation of workers is the necessary condition for the reproduction of capitalists. For this absolutely critical deduction, however, Marx did not have to explain the basis of this existing standard of necessity. Indeed, he simply assumed it as given, which was an assumption he indicated in, in several places he intended to remove in his projected book on wage labor. With his approach of making that assumption, Marx was able to reveal the nature of capital and its inherent tendencies, something that a focus on appearances can never reveal. Thus, the case was made for the necessity to end capitalist relations of production rather than to struggle for fair wages. How else could we understand what capital is without the critique of those forms of appearance which underlie the moral economy of the working class in capitalism? Indeed, the apparent relation of exchange between capitifies the actual relation, quote, and ensures the perception the perpetuation of a specific relationship of dependency, endowing it with the deceptive illusion of a transaction. To an, end of quote. To enable workers to go beyond that conservative motto to the revolutionary watchword, Marx offered the weapon of critique, a critique based on an alternative political economy, <coughs> the political economy of the working class. However, The political economy of the working class introduced by Marx was incomplete. What determines the standards underlying concepts of fairness? What determines the equilibrium, which is the basis of consensus? That's not a question that Marx explicitly considered theoretically. After all, he began with the assumption that the traditional standard of life, the standard of necessity, was given. While that assumption was sufficient to demonstrate that capital is the result of the exploitation of workers, with this assumption, we cannot explore theoretically what determines the standard of necessity. Accordingly, we're unable to consider the factors which cause the standard of necessity to change. What allows it to be driven downward? And what prevents this? In my book, Beyond Capital, I demonstrated that with the removal of this assumption of a fixed standard of life, the assumption that Marx intended to remove in his book on wage labor, it is no longer possible to argue that the automatic effect of productivity increases is the growth of exploitation. In other words, you can no longer, with what the tools there, once you remove that, that assumption of a fixed standard of necessity, you can no longer make the case that Marx makes in capital for relative surplus value, in inevitably flowing from increased productivity. To understand the determination of the standard of necessity and the rate of exploitation and any movements in these, the state of class struggle is essential to consider. And for that purpose, I introduce as a variable the concept of the degree of separation among workers. 
which is a concept that draws upon Marx's observation in Capital that, quote, the dispersal of the rural workers breaks their power of resistance while concentration increases that of the urban workers, close quote. And then later, he says, quote, the workers' power of resistance declines with their dispersal, close quote. By explicitly articulating this variable, the degree of separation among workers, we acknowledge that the potential for collective struggle, both its emergence and its prospect for success, will be significantly influenced by the degree of separation among workers. If workers are isolated and atomized, if they're separated from other workers and indeed view them as enemies, then there's little prospect for collective action. As Marx commented with respect to the antagonism between English and Irish workers, quote, this is the secret of the impotence of the English working class despite its organization, close quote. And indeed, it should be obvious that workers are separated not merely or not purely by economic factors. Racism, sexism, geographical location, as well as legal and ideological barriers to collective action all contribute to separation among workers. And thus, they contribute to the maintenance of existing structures. Marx noted with respect to the impotence of the English working class that the separation of English and Irish, Irish workers is, quote, the secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power, and that class is fully aware of it, close quote. Now, while that's clearly relevant to capitalism, this aspect of class struggle transcends capitalism itself. In Beyond Capital, I stress that in any society, quote, those who mediate among producers have an interest in maintaining and increasing the degree of separation, division, and atomization among work producers in order to continue to secure the fruits of cooperation in production, close quote. And we can see what happens, all other things equal, when there are significant increases in the degree of separation among workers. When overaccumulation of capital and the ensuing increase in the intensity of capitalist competition, which was a process which began before the much evoked, you know, um, sort of more recent process of globalization of capital, when that overaccumulation of capital brings with it an assault on the apparent labor, capital labor accord, and when the economic crisis in real socialism leads to attacks upon the egalitarian impulses and job rights of workers, in short, upon the social contract of real socialism, we see that the equilibrium characteristic of an existing moral economy is only an apparent one. It's one which rests upon the reproduction of a given degree of separation of producers. As long as the degree of separation, or to use a more common term, the balance of class forces, as long as this is constant, this implies the reproduction of an equilibrium in which any deviations produce feedback tendencies to restore the norms. And insofar as such deviations are temporary, it strengthens the belief in the permanency of those particular norms. But the existing moral economy itself can never explain its basis. In other words, why those particular beliefs as to what is fair are present, and thus why those norms can change. To grasp the conditions which underlie conditions of fairness at any given moment, it's necessary to move from the moral economy of the working class to the political economy of the working class. For revolutionaries who would help to put an end to existing structures of exploitation and deformation, it's essential to recognize the importance of the moral economy of the working class, but to go beyond it. We need to understand how the system is reproduced and how divisions among producers play an essential role in that reproduction. With that understanding, there is possibility. Possibility. <laughs> However, understanding the nature of the system as a source of the anger and unhappiness of the people of people is not a sufficient condition for going beyond the system. It's also essential to focus upon the alternative implicit in the political economy of the working class, what Marx called in Capital the work, quote, the workers' own need for development, close quote. For people whose sense of fairness has been violated, the vision of an alternative is necessary one that can appear to workers as a new common sense, as their common sense. Like the worst architect, referring to Marx's description of the labor process, like the worst architect, for the revolutionary labor process, we must build that goal in our minds before we can construct it in reality. Only this conscious purpose can ensure the purposeful will required. Rather than the abstract proletarians characteristic of bad theory, though, 
the starting point should be real people with particular ideas and concepts which are reflected in an existing moral economy. As we see, the existing concept of fairness as reflected in the moral economy of the working class are seriously limited. Not only is it impossible at this level to understand the basis of those current concepts, but the spontaneous tendency of moral economy is to look backward. Characteristic is the attempt to restore a previous equilibrium, either an immediate one or an idealized one from the past. It's a vision of the past rather than a vision for the future. To see the future in the present is what is needed if we are to build that future. To articulate what is implicit in current concepts and struggles is essential for the development of a conscious vision of a new society. By considering current social norms and beliefs as to what is right and what is wrong, we can avoid the tendency to begin with a preconceived theory and then to see nothing else. Further, we may be able to identify elements in the moral economy that potentially point beyond toward a new society, a society of associated producers. In the book that I've just completed, Contradictions of Real Socialism, for example, I identified three elements in the moral economy of the working class in real socialism that contain implicitly within them characteristics of a society of associated producers. First, in the orientation of workers toward egalitarianism, we can see glimpses of one such characteristic, the focus upon the common ownership of the means of production, which implies the right to share equally as owners as the repeated exhortations of the vanguard against egalitarianism, you'll know Stalin's petty bourgeois egalitarianism, as that demonstrates, this sense of entitlement had real lasting power in the minds of workers. Further, solidarity of workers within their individual workplaces, as manifested in their mutual support in protecting each other against managers, and through their spontaneous cooperation in making production possible, generated a sense of their collective power and latent support for workers' control. Just as the spontaneous food riots of the 18th century revealed the underlying moral economy of the crowd, so also does the spontaneous emergence of workers' councils, as in Hungary in 1956 and Poland in 1980, allow us to infer the existence of an underlying consensus among workers. And that orientation toward worker management was acknowledged by the vanguard itself when it sought to shore up support for its role, as in Yugoslavia in 1950, Czechoslovakia in 1968, and initial gestures in perestroika. <coughs> Finally, within that moral economy, was it a third aspect, was a tendency for people to help each other without demanding an equivalent in return. An economy of favors is how Elena Ledineva described the Soviet Union. Rather than relations in which alienated, mutually indifferent individuals exchange alienated things, characteristic of real socialism is the presence of gift relations within networks of friends and family. That gift relation, she notes, is, quote, created and preserved by mutual sense of fairness and trust, close quote. It presumes people who have a bond, people who have a past and hope to have a future, and its product is the enhancement of solidarity within those bounds. In this third element of the moral economy of the working class in real socialism, there is latent a society based on solidarity and community, one where we support others to the best of our ability. In the moral economy of the working class in real socialism, we can thus gla glimpse three sides of what I identified in the socialist alternative as the organic system of socialism, which Hugo Chavez of Venezuela called the elementary socialist triangle. Social ownership of the means of production, social production organized by workers, and communal needs and purposes as the goal of productive activity. By articulating the characteristics of this particular combination of production, distribution, and consumption, it's possible to present a coherent vision that transcends the existing moral economy. And it's not only in real socialism that such elements are implicit. In current struggles within capitalism, both within imperialist and colonial countries, similar themes are present, equality, democracy, and solidarity. By themselves, those themes represent partial rejections of existing structures. 
However, to the extent that they remain partial, they cannot offer a vision that goes beyond the existing moral economy. By demonstrating their interdependence within, organic, within an organic socialist system, it's possible to offer an alternative common sense, one which contains a new sense of fairness, the potential for a new moral economy. Of course, we all know that the real socialism of the 20th century is not that vision. There is, though, a new vision of socialism that has emerged in the 21st century as an alternative to the barbarism of capitalism. And at its core is the alternative that Marx evoked in capital. In contrast to a society in which the worker exists to satisfy the needs of capital for its growth, Marx pointed to, quote, the inverse situation in which objective wealth is there to satisfy the worker's own need for development, close quote. Human development, in short, is at the center of this vision of an alternative to capitalism. From his early discussion of a rich human being to his later comments about the, quote, development of the rich individuality, which is as all-sided in its production as in its consumption, close quote, to the develop his comment about the development of all human powers as such, the end in itself, and the all-round development of the indi individual, Marx focused upon our need for the full development of our capacities. This is the essence of his conception of socialism, a society that removes all obstacles to the full development of human beings. But Marx always understood that human development requires practice. It does not come as a gift from above. His concept of revolutionary practice, that concept of the coincidence of changing of circumstances and human activity or self-change, is the red thread that runs throughout his work. In every process of human activity, there is more than one product of labor. Starting from his articulation of the concept of revolutionary practice, Marx consistently stressed that through their activity, people simultaneously change as they change circumstances. We develop ourselves, in short, through our own practice and are the products of all our activities, the products of our struggles or the lack of same, the products of all our relations in which we produce and interact. In every human activity, in short, there is a joint product both the change in the object of labor and the change in the laborer herself. Marx's unity of human development and practice constitutes the key link that we need to grasp if we are to talk about socialism. What kind of productive relations can provide the conditions for the full development of human capacities? Only those in which there's conscious cooperation among associated producers. Only those in which the goal of production is that of the workers themselves. Worker management, which ends the division between thinking and doing, is essential, but clearly this requires more than worker management in individual workplaces. They must be the goals of workers in society, too, workers in their communities. Implicit in this emphasis upon the key link of human development practice, accordingly, is our need to be able to develop through democratic, participatory, and protagonistic activities in every aspect of our lives through revolutionary practice in our communities, our workplaces, and in all our social institutions, we produce ourselves as rich human beings, rich in capacities and needs, in contrast to the impoverished and crippled human beings that capitalism produces. This concept is one of democracy in practice, democracy as practice, democracy as protagonism. Democracy in this sense, protagonistic democracy in the workplace, protagonistic democracy in neighborhoods, communities, communes, is the democracy of people who are transforming themselves into revolutionary subjects. Social production organized by workers is essential for developing the cap capacities of people and building new relations, relations of cooperation and solidarity. If workers do not make decisions in their workplaces and communities and develop their capacities, we can be certain that someone else does. In short, protagonistic democracy in all our workplaces is an essential condition for the full development of producers. But as I've suggested, there are other elements in this socialist combination. The society we want to build is one which recognizes, in the words of the Communist Manifesto, that the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. How can we ensure, though, that our communal social productivity is directed to the free development of all rather than used to satisfy the private goals of capitalists, groups of individuals, or state bureaucrats? 
Social ownership of the means of production is that second side. And of course, it's essential to understand that social ownership is not the same as state ownership. Social ownership involve, implies a profound democracy, one in which people function as subjects, both as producers and as members of society, in determining the use of the results of our social labor. Our common ownership of the means of production and cooperation in the process of production, however sufficient for ensuring overall human development, what kind of people are produced when we relate to each other through an exchange relation and try to get the best deal possible for ourselves? This brings us to a third side of that triangle, the satisfaction of communal needs and communal purposes. Here the focus is upon the importance of basing our productive activity upon recognition of our common humanity and our needs as members of the human family. In short, the premise is the development of a solidarian society, one in which we go beyond self-interest and where through activity, our activity we both build solidarity among people and at the same time produce ourselves differently. Communicating that vision is essential. And of course it's not easy. The battle of ideas is never easy, especially in times of crisis when the spontaneous tendency is to look backward to the old moral economy and to search for scapegoats to explain what has gone wrong. There's further no lack of alternative visions rooted in existing cultures and religions that foster the focus upon state scapegoats. For this reason, in the ideological struggle, we need to try to articulate what is implicit in current concepts and struggles and to develop a conscious vision of a new society. I've argued that at the core of that vision is the concept of the key link of human development and practice, a concept which is easiest to accept when people think about what they want for their children. And to this end, I propose to the, in the socialist alternative, a simple set of propositions, what I call a charter for human development, that can be recognized as self-evident requirements for human development. One, everyone has the right to share in the social heritage of human beings, an equal right to the use and products of the social brain and the social hand in order to develop his or her full potential. Two. Everyone has the right to be able to develop their full potential and capacities through democracy, participation, and protagonism in the workplace and society, a process in which these subjects of activity have the precondition of the health and education that permit them to make full use of this opportunity. Three, everyone has the right to live in a society in which human beings and nature can be nurtured a society in which we can develop our full potential in communities based upon cooperation and solidarity. The goal of such a charter is to redefine the concept of fairness, to stress that it is unfair that some people monopolize the social heritage of all human beings, that it is unfair that some people are able to develop their capacities through their activities while others are crippled and deformed, and that it is unfair that we are forced into structures which, in which we view each other as competitors and enemies. Is it possible to redefine the concept of fairness and to build a new moral economy of the working class? Certainly, it's not inevitable. The choice before us is familiar, socialism or barbarism. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could uh, talk a bit about, um, you, you, you talked about, jeez, uh, um, my mind's going blank. Uh, take somebody else. That's right, mine's <laughs> blank too. Any other questions? Could you speak up because I, I have bad hearing and then flying on the plane completely destroys it too. Sorry. Um, Thank you very much. And what are your thoughts on diversity and how diversity fits into the commonality that you're arguing for, the human, you know, the common human humanity, you know, not owning certain cultural things which you then say others are appropriating and all those kinds of characteristics that seem to be um, that's being discussed right now. Is there any other questions? Um, 
first of all, thanks for even just bringing up real socialism and, and, t and at least even just touching on the significance of the October Revolution and the socialist countries, the gains that were made by millions of people that were never seen ever before. Um, I just want to kind of ask if you do see a continuity between socialism of the 20th century and 21st century. I know you kind of divide these two, but I'm not so sure myself that that those aren't our, not only our direct ancestors, but probably one of the biggest sources of uh, historical and, and theoretical uh, foundation for our coming projects. So I'm just wondering if you see a clean break or where you separate the wheat from the chaff, maybe. Thanks, Mike, for the talk. My question is about the role of workers in the informal economy. It being, or living in the context of Venezuela, I'm sure you've thought about um, a lot of what you've said presumes some kind of direct relationship in terms of a wage relationship between the proletariat, well, the worker and capital. And so, how do workers who fall outside of that realm figure in in your analysis in terms of? possibilities for revolution and socialism given this notion of fairness that you've articulated? Sure, I'll take, um, let me take that one first. Um, first of all, what do we mean by workers in the informal sector? Um, I would argue that many workers in the informal sector are in fact part of the capitalist sphere of circulation. Um, that they are you know, working with capitalists produced goods uh, and selling them you know, um, in the streets or whatever, um, and that uh, the situation, that they are, you know, in a situation because of the weakness of workers, because of a large reserve army of the unemployed, capital has contrived to make them bear the risks rather than receiving wages. Uh, so we have to try to think of them in that, you know, we have to situate them that way. Um, and in, in Venezuela, um, the way in which um, the, uh, a, a way of, of approaching them different ways to approach and organize. People or tried to organize streets, um, you know, where, where the Pujanaros were working uh, and selling. Uh, and, and in many cases, one of the ways in which people have been approaching the question uh, is to try to organize in communities um, through, and, and through organizing the communal councils. And the communal councils which emerged in Venezuela, the first real uh, conscious attempt to create the communal councils came from a group of people who had been in a Trotskyist group who said, we're trying to organize the wrong people, and they went off into a community to organize communal councils. Um, and they, because their argument was, this is how, and this is the only way we can reach informal sector. Um, so that, I, I think I would answer, I think that answers your question. I, you, know, you have to find ways to reach them, but it's, I think, wrong to assume that workers have only been reached and organized in their places of work. They've always been reached through their communities. You know, uh, many often they're they're reached. You know, uh, through you know, locational communities. Um, but often they're they're reached through their ethnic communities. Certainly, that's true of immigrant workers. You you know, organize some you know uh, you know people from one particular immigrant group. You have now access to all those hospitals. You know, that are that are drawing upon the, that same ethnic group. You know, because the word spreads. Um, so I think you know we we have to recognize that that you know. Uh, organizing workers is, is not one-dimensional. You know, so. As far as the question of diversity versus um, commonality, and my, my thoughts on that. Um, well, I, th I thought I, I basically indicated what I felt about that. Uh, I think it's absolutely wrong to attack people who focus on diversity, who have their, their you know, that who have their identities in particular, you know, have particular characteristics. Uh, you have to take them as the starting point, and then proceed to show them that the tr the questions go beyond. Uh, that's what I mean here by saying we we start with real people and their ideas and what they are struggling over, <coughs> and then we attempt to show. And, and Marx said this in this letter in 1843. You know, we do not tell. You know, we try to explain to people why they are struggling. You know, we're take, you take people who are already struggling and you try to explain the underlying structure. And the argument I was making here was if you don't, then you are left with this perspective which is at the forms of appearance and you don't get them to understand the nature of the system and thereby create the potential of going bonded. So, so 
there's a starting point, but there are limits to remaining at that starting point. Um, as far as the uh, issue of 20th century socialism versus 21st century socialism, the first question you know, every socialist should ask is, why didn't workers resist the ending of the return of capitalism? You know, I mean, that's the first question you have to ask. You know, country after country, there was no resistance. And you know, the same process, I mean, I, I, I'm very closely attached to Cuba you know, in terms of my own emotional and political feelings. Uh, and it's a horror for me to read you know, the Cuban economists saying exactly what the Soviet economists and all the Eastern European economists were saying in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, um, in, in the book, I actually say, in the, in the book, I say the economists were the spokesperson of capital. Um, you know, and that's true in Cuba as well at this particular point. Uh, so the first question we, we have to ask, why? You know, uh, what was wrong in, in that model of 20th century socialism? Uh, certainly, you know, providing all these things that workers in capitalism could not possibly get. You know, uh, the, the security in the job, security in, you know, in, in terms of their consumption, all these aspects, the access to education, the access to health, you know, that was, you know, it's a paradox, though, in the sense that it's a paradox because those are things that the most highly organized working class movements within capitalism could not achieve, but you didn't have a highly organized working class movement in real socialism. You know, in fact, you had an atomized working class movement. It, you know, it, it, it was not even, you know, not only did it not, was not, not allowed to organize autonomously, it also had no theoretical links because the concept of Marxism was usurped by what I call vanguard Marxism. Uh, so, you know, that, that is a, a, a serious question. And I would say that one of the most central issues is the one I'm referring to here is that in the absence of people making you know, decisions within the workplace, um, someone else develops their capabilities. Workers did not develop their capabilities, did not develop you know, uh, an ability to organize, uh, and um, you know, they were alienated from the system. Um, and uh, there were experiments um, and, you know, in various places. Um, you know, in, in the Soviet Union, there was one experiment called the Akchi experiment, where they began to you know, rotate work, you know, rotate leadership within, within the you know, particular uh, communes. Um, and, you know, and it was go going very nicely. Um, and productivity was increased. And it was killed. You know? And one of the central questions always was, and I've seen it you know, in a number of places, question was, well, if they're doing this, what's the role of the party? <laughs> I mean, if, you know, uh, and that, that is a, a problem. So my book is, has the subtitle, The Conductor and the Conducted. Um, and you know, uh, and the, the concept of the conductor is the conductor thinks that they are able to bring all these wonderful things, and that if they have the power, they will deliver socialism. Um, but there's a problem when people are just conducted. Got